Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to our Tuesday at 2 press conference in regards to COVID-19. Uh, you'll be hearing uh, very shortly from Dr. Burstein, uh, but of course, we're also joined by Kendra Schmidt from Deaf Access Services to provide the American Sign Language. And uh, thank everyone for participating today because we have some, of course, information to share with you with regards to COVID-19 in our community. Uh, first up, through May 9th, there were 87,282 unique COVID-19 cases in Erie County. That is a total of 1,037 total new cases in the last seven days. That number on a seven-day average has dropped. We're very happy to talk about that uh, because that's the direction we want to be going is downward. Uh, the average per seven days is 113 total new cases per 100,000 residents. We were hoping it would get under 100 by the end of the past week, but it didn't. But we're getting closer, and that's a very important measurement stick for a number of things, uh, including schools. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, hospitalizations on May 9th, there were 210 people in Western New York hospitals, 65 in the ICU. Of the 210 patients, 168 were in Erie County hospitals. 50 were in the ICU, uh, 30 on an airway assist. Three died in the hospital on May 9th. We've had a number of deaths continue uh, in Erie County hospitals. Uh, we'll be talking more about mortality data soon enough, uh, but uh, it is disappointing to continue to see that individuals are dying. And as we'll talk about, the vast majority, actually almost 99% of these individuals uh, were not vaccinated. Uh, so uh, many of these deaths could have been prevented if individuals had been vaccinated. Uh, the hospitalization data, a two-week chart, 69% uh, of Erie County beds are occupied. That's good. We want to keep it somewhere in that level. We don't want to see 75, 80% of our beds occupied. Uh, COVID-19 hospitalizations have decreased by 45% in the last three weeks. 30% uh, of the COVID-19 patients are in the ICU. That number has been up, uh, creeping upwards. Uh, the number of hospitalizations has been going down. We have seen a reduction in our ICU numbers, but uh, not to the same degree as overall numbers. And 55% of COVID-19 hospitalizations are 64 and under. I have a very bad itch on my nose, <laughs> so excuse me. <laughs> but uh, uh, confirmed cases over the past six weeks, this is a big drop. I want to thank everybody. Uh, we've, we've dropped a tremendous amount since the beginning of April with regards to the new cases on a seven-day period. Uh, the week ending Mar or April 10th, there were 369 Point six uh, new cases for every 100,000 people over a seven-day period. That's gone down to 117.7 as of the 8th, and that's dropped even a little more as we talked about as of the 9th. So uh, we've had a 67% reduction uh, from the week of uh, April 17th, a little larger from the week of uh, April 10th. And thank you. That's because of the great work of so many individuals to protect themselves by being vaccinated, as well as those individuals who uh, 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 took the proper measures such as wearing your masks when out in public and you know, taking proper social distancing guidance so that uh, we are seeing a, a reduction in, in cases by a tremendous amount and we're very happy to continue to see that. Uh, new COVID cases, we're still seeing some high numbers in the city of Buffalo uh, in the 200s and 300s per 100,000. We've had some huge drops in some of our suburban areas so I want to thank uh, the communities that are doing great. We need to do better as overall as a county, and we need some of our areas like uh, the 14212 zip code, which is the Buffalo, Broadway, and Sloan area. It says some very high numbers at 338 per 100,000 over seven days. Same thing with Buffalo, Chicago, 14211. Uh, Buffalo East Side, uh, 14215 is very high, as well as the other part of Buffalo East Side, 14208. So in general, the county seems to be doing much better. We have some areas of concern still. Uh, and we're going to continue to work with our partners across the community to see those numbers drop. Uh, but we need everyone to play a role so that we can uh, get back to normal. And that's why it can't be dependent upon any one individual, any one neighborhood, any one town. Everyone has to play a role. And I thank those who played a role to, to make it better. Uh, confirm COVID-19 cases by age group over the past seven days. We're still seeing the highest case numbers in the 10 to 19, 20 to 29, 30 to 39 age category. Uh, after that, it really does drop. Uh, if it wasn't for the 10 to 39 age category, our community would no longer be considered a community of high transmission. Uh, but because of the, from the basically middle school to high school age, and then the prime working adult from 20 to 39, we are still higher than we need to be. So we really need folks to, 
to buck down and, and do what's right, get vaccinated if you can get vaccinated, uh, and uh, do your best to protect the general public. We've seen really good numbers uh, basically in the uh, above 50 category. That's great and uh, very happy to see that. Only 22 new cases in the 80 and above age range and 29 for the last week in the 70 to 79. So uh, we're very happy to see those numbers, but we need every age group to, to make a difference for us to try to get back to normal. So uh, for those that are in the younger age category, please, uh, if you can get vaccinated, get vaccinated. It really makes a difference. And then the comparison by weeks, uh, we're still seeing, once again, in the 14 to 17 age category, uh, nearly 9% of the tests that were performed tested positive. Uh, that's down from 9.7 the week before. Uh, the 11 to 13 age category was 6.7%, down from 8.4% the week before. But then you look at the other numbers, and they're much lower. They're, uh, once you get over the age of 18, they're all uh, under 3.0 or 3.0 and under. So uh, shows that we're doing a very good job of keeping the, the, the spread of COVID-19 down. And if we can get it as a community below 100 new cases uh, for a 100,000 population on average on a seven-day basis, we're really going to do a much better job of seeing those numbers even drop further. So let's keep on doing that to... Uh, to see that uh, our numbers drop to a point where we are not seeing much of any COVID-19 in our community. School cases dropped again. Uh, these are cases, new cases associated with uh, individuals in schools, students, teachers, administrators, other staff. Uh, we only had 239 cases in the most recent week. Uh, and the vast majority of those, once again, were students. Uh, there was some uh, school to school transmission our epidemiology staff uh, determined uh, not a whole lot and i'll let dr burstein talk a little bit more as we go through but uh, we did see some and uh, we just want to remind everybody that everyone can catch COVID 19 regardless of their age and everyone can spread it uh, and that's why we're going to try to vaccinate a whole lot more people including the 12 to 15 year age category now that we can vaccinate them with the pfizer drug mortality data by age group uh, I, I'm sorry to say that in the month of April 2021, uh, more people died in that month under the age of 50 than any prior month. Previously, it was tied with April of 2020. There was another death on April 30th. And so 12 individuals died that were 49 ages or less in the month of April of this year. And there were 99 people who died in April of this year, uh, which was a, a, almost a, not a doubling, but near doubling from uh, the month of March. And we saw a drop in the average age to 70, the youngest age as an average it had been throughout the entire pandemic. We have had already 13 deaths in the month of May uh, through, I believe that's May 6th. So uh, we're still seeing people dying in the hospital. And uh, it's very sad when we see this and we know that uh, the vast majority of these individuals uh, had not been fully vaccinated. Of the 112 COVID-19 associated deaths in the month of April and May, only three people were fully vaccinated prior to infection. And uh, both of those, or all three of those individuals, I've been told, had serious immunocompromised issues, other health-related issues uh, that made their vaccination a tougher one for them to be protected. So uh, unfortunately, 109 individuals perished in April and May so far of this year who were not fully vaccinated. And, and if they had been fully vaccinated, uh, maybe they'd be with us today. Uh, the other thing that's distressing is 43% of the people in the April and May uh, reside in the city of Buffalo. The increased number of cases in the city of Buffalo means increased hospitalizations of Buffalo residents and invariably, unfortunately, increased deaths. So uh, what I'm asking my friends in the city of Buffalo is take this seriously. We have a lot of vaccine clinics that are going on in the city of Buffalo through the month of May. Please take advantage of them. There are other locations to get vaccinated as well. Do not ignore COVID-19 thinking it's over because it's not. And 112 of our county residents have died in April and May alone from the COVID-19 vaccine. That's basically based on 43% of the Buffalo residents. We're talking about somewhere in the vicinity of 47 to 50 individuals who probably died from the city of Buffalo in April and May. And the vast majority of those individuals, as we said, had not been vaccinated. Please get vaccinated. It might save your life. Uh, I will turn over to Dr. Burstein now 
to talk about uh, some of the actions we're taking on Erie County response, which are quite a few. Let me put my mask on. Thank you. Good afternoon. So um, first of all, we'll start off with testing. The Erie County Health Department is still offering diagnostic testing for anybody that wants to get tested. And again, we highly recommend that uh, people who are returning from travel or people who might have been exposed to COVID-19, especially there are people living in your household with COVID-19, please get a test. All you need is an appointment. Call 858-2929 to schedule a test. We're offering the PCR or molecular diagnostic tests and also that the results are gonna be available in one to three business days and then also the rapid tests, which the results are available before you drive away. So just wanna talk about some trends that we're seeing with our case investigation. So I was uh, speaking with our uh, contact tracers yesterday and they've just shared with me some alarming trends. So um, first of all, uh, we, you know, we're really begging parents to work closely with us to help keep everybody in their schools and in their extracurricular activities healthy. So um, we're finding that uh, some parents are sending their children to school even though they are in quarantine. And uh, we always find out about it. Uh, the school will tell us. We have other surveillance methods to know uh, who the siblings are in the home and should be in quarantine and just makes a lot of extra work for our staff. So please, if your kids are in quarantine, please keep them home and please get them tested five to seven days after exposure. Also, we know a lot of parents aren't testing their kids uh, who are exposed because you know, they don't want them to have to isolate. However, uh, you know, that can actually prolong their return to work because what we're finding now is um, you know, kids have quarantined, they don't get a test, then a couple weeks later, they develop symptoms and their test is positive for COVID-19. We don't know if that's residual RNA from a prior infection when they were exposed or is this a new infection? And so we just have to assume it's a new infection and so then they have to go into isolation. So please work with us. Also, we're finding that some businesses are not cooperating with our contact tracers and not telling us information about who close contacts were in child care centers, uh, dance studios, and other small businesses. So please, we all want the same thing. We all want businesses to open up, schools to open up, sports to open up. So please, let's all adhere by the rules and keep people in quarantine uh, who should be in quarantine. Um, also, we're seeing some, um, some trends from the schools with our case investigation. Um, unfortunately, um, and not unexpected, we're finding that we're seeing of evidence of transmission on the school bus, so not only in the classroom. And this is not surprising, we would expect this, because school buses now where more kids have returned to school, uh, they're more crowded, and so there's uh, more opportunity for transmission. Also, you know, the bus driver has hopefully uh, the, their back to the students, their eyes are straight ahead, so it's really hard to keep track on, you know, what the kids are doing. Uh, so we don't know if they're adhering to masks and, and social distancing. Also, um, we're finding that there are uh, some families, um, they're being told by their health care provider that if there's a case in the household, you know, just assume everybody's positive and don't bother testing. But as I mentioned earlier, it's really important to get tested so we know what your status is and we can act accordingly. Again, we just want to bring our numbers, continue to bring our numbers down. So please get tested five to seven days after exposure. Also, um, and now changing the topic to some good news, we're um, making some great headway, some great progress with our vaccination efforts. So um, through May 10th in Erie County, 50% of Erie County residents had received their first dose. So that's 463,000 271 Erie County residents. And that's 61% of all the eligible residents had their first dose. And then um, for among Erie County residents, 41% have received their second dose. So they, uh, so we can see, see that there are a lot of people that are fully vaccinated in our community. That's 373,862, which is almost 50% of all eligible Erie County residents are fully vaccinated. So that's uh, we wanna keep that number going up and so we can keep our case numbers going down. So um, this is a chart that we show every week looking at the uh, vaccine distribution by zip code uh, among the proportion of eligible people who have had at least one dose as of May 10th. 
So the yellow <clears throat> is, corresponds to rural zip codes, the green corresponds to suburban zip codes, and the blue corresponds to urban zip codes. And so um, this is of uh, um, increasing uh, proportion of people vaccinated. So you can see that we're you know, really struggling to reach the people who are, uh, live in many, in many of the areas of Buffalo um, and, and in our rural areas. And if you recall, when the county executive showed the areas where we're seeing, you know, still continue to see high numbers of COVID-19, you know, these are the same areas that are seeing low vaccination rates. So we're really gonna try hard to reach the people in these communities, make it easy for them to make a smart choice and get vaccinated. So um, just some other uh, COVID-19 vaccine trivia from Erie County. So um, there are about a third of our 16 and 17 year olds have had at least one dose of COVID-19. So we're well on our way of getting that population vaccinated. 82% um, of Erie County residents over the age of 65 have received at least one dose of COVID-19. So we're making great headway, headway on that. And then I wanna call out the vaccine superstar areas. So since last week, 100% of people, Erie County residents who are the age of 65 plus have been have received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine in Farmhand, North Collins, Bowmansville, and Buffalo 14261 zip code. So just want to shout out congratulations to those areas. Also, you know, again, we're seeing places that have lower uh, a lower number of people who are over the age of 65 who are vaccinated. Remember, this is a really vulnerable population to getting sick. So we really want to work with our partners in North Evans, only have 35 percent. Buffalo, 14208, just 52 percent. Boston, just 57 percent. Buffalo, 14206, just 59 percent. And Buffalo, 14211, just 62 percent. There have only been minimal increases since last Last week when I called out these numbers. So please let us help you stay healthy and keep our COVID-19 numbers down. So uh, we still are offering vac uh, vaccine clinics every week, trying to think of new and innovative ideas. So we still have our large uh, vaccine clinics that we're kind of winding down at uh, ECC South, ECC North, and KeyBank Center. We also have multiple pop-up clinics throughout the week, and that's where we're really trying to concentrate our efforts in the pop-up clinics to make it easier for people to get vaccinated. Um, we strongly suggest that people make appointments. However, if you just feel like walking in when it's a time and a place convenient to you, you are welcome. We are not gonna turn anybody away who is eligible to get vaccine. So, and we are always gonna be announcing our, our new vaccine sites. Um, if you want information about the COVID-19 vaccines, I know a lot of people have questions, um, you call our hotline at 858-2929 to ask a question or schedule an appointment or um, go to our website to schedule. So some great news uh, for, um, from uh, the pediatrician on me and for the COVID-19 vaccine. So yesterday, the FDA authorized emergency use of the Pfizer vaccine for 12 to 15 year olds. So uh, tomorrow, um, CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is meeting, and they're gonna make recommendations for how to use the vaccine for the 12 to 15 year olds. And then, you know, the games will be on, we'll be able to reach the, that population. So we are uh, in Erie County Health Department, we're planning to offer uh, special clinics for uh, kids that are 12 and up with our Pfizer vaccine. Um, we're also coordinating clinics with many of our school districts just to make it easy for people to get vaccinated. Go, we're trying to meet people where they are. And also um, we are working with our community pediatrician's office or any primary care office that sees adolescents and we are gladly giving them Pfizer vaccine so they can vaccinate their patients. Because it's, uh, you know, the cold chain is, um, it is pretty difficult to maintain for a long period of time. And also for the offices, they have to, they have to order a very large quantity of a vaccine over a thousand doses. So we can do that for them, just make it easier for them to vaccinate your patients. So if you're a parent, talk to your pediatrician about getting your kids vaccinated for COVID-19. Also, uh, we are gonna be at a few schools in the upcoming weeks. On uh, tomorrow, we're gonna be at Lackawanna High School. 
Uh, the following week, um, on May 18th, we're going to be at Springville High School. And on May 27th, we're going to be at Grand Island High School. And we are going to uh, have additional clinics with high schools. So we're going to announce those. So you can, again, to make an appointment, go on our website or call our hotline at 858-2929. And then also, we're trying so hard to get to those communities that haven't, haven't had good vaccine penetration. So on uh, May 14th, we're going to be at the Community Church Jehovah. On May 17th, we're going to be at the Commodore Perry Homes. May 18th, we're going to be at the Marshall, Martha Mitchell Community Center. May 25th, we're going to be at the Marine Drive Apartments. So please let us vaccinate. Let us keep you healthy and protected against COVID-19. So um, after that, I am going to turn it over for our county executive to finish talking about the great uh, vaccine ideas that we have. Thank you, doctor. Uh, I want to thank the school districts that are working with us. I know having talked with the superintendent, uh, Keith Lewis of Lackawanna, they're very interested. The vaccine clinics that we're doing at these school districts, of course, are for students, but also we are scheduling for parents, guardians. So if you got a, a graduation coming up, you want to have that graduation in person. I know it's an issue with some of these school districts. They can only have a certain amount of people. Well, if they're vaccinated, there's a much greater chance they'll be able to attend graduation. So we're trying to schedule these as quickly as possible so that individuals will get both of their doses before graduation. Same thing with pop-up clinics. I want to thank everyone. These are all City of Buffalo pop-up clinics you have here, but we do have other clinics going across the, the, the county, but we know there's a significant area of concern with regards to cases in the City of Buffalo, especially in the east side of Buffalo, some parts of the west side. So that's where most of these clinics are. And I want to thank our partners for uh, working with us on that. And then, of course, we have our Shot in a Chaser clinic. The uh, first one was this last weekend at Resurgence Brewery in Buffalo. It went great. Got 10 times as many people as what we've been getting for some of our first dose clinics elsewhere. We have our next one tomorrow at Flying Bison Brewery uh, in Buffalo. And then on Saturday, we're at the Steel Brown uh, uh, Brewery Springville location. There's a Steel Bound uh, in Ellicottville, I believe. There's, of course, this one in Springville. We'll be in Springville in Southern Erie County. And we'll be at the Thin Man Tapo location on Chandler Street in Buffalo on the 15th. Then we're going to 12 Gates in Amherst on the 20th. We're doing Soho Buffalo, which of course isn't a brewery, but it's a, it's a restaurant, it has a big crowd that often goes to it. On the 21st, you can sign up for any of these clinics by going to the website, bit.ly slash ecbrew, or calling 716-858-2929 to uh, schedule your appointment. These are walk-in also, but we think it's easier for people to come in or schedule beforehand so they know the exact time, they get in quicker. You get a pint glass from us. You can use that pint glass to fill it up to a drink of your choice. All of these locations, I wanna thank them all for doing that. Uh, it's a great uh, way of getting more people vaccinated, especially in our younger crowd that maybe didn't feel the need to get vaccinated because they thought, I'm young, I'm, I'm gonna be invulnerable to this. We know that from some of the people who showed up at Resurgence that they thought, well, eventually I get vaccinated, but I didn't really think I needed it. But uh, telling them that they get a free beer, and when they come back the second time, they get another free beer. That was enough incentive for a few folks. So I want to thank all our partners for making this a reality and, and uh, basically making it known nationally as it's been reported on nationally on how good the first day was. And we're certainly hoping for another great day tomorrow uh, with the Flying Bison as well as the other clinics that are later in the week and the weeks that follow. And then we have a very important announcement to make with regards to another feature we're offering to make it easier for you to get vaccinated. Vax visits. It's a new program for any Erie County resident. A Vax visit team will come to your home to vaccinate you or your household in your home. We were just first doing this for those who were homebound, but now we are opening it up to anyone. You can call 716-858-2929 to schedule or get yourself on the list to be one of the individuals or your family, depending on who you have, especially if you have kids now in the 12 to 15 age category. So we will come to your house and vaccinate you in your home, We're trying to make it as easy as possible to get as many people vaccinated as possible. You won't get a free certificate of beer, but you don't need to leave your home to get vaccinated. So call 858-2929. Uh, vaccinations will be provided either by the Erie County Department of Health staff or our home nursing agencies that we've been working with. 
Uh, so I'm not certain if it'll be a health department person, but what we need you to do is call. We'll get you into the line. We'll then schedule the appointment based on whether it's the Erie County Department of Health or one of our partners who will do it in your home. And there's no cost to it. We'll come straight to your house to vaccinate you in your home. If you got five people there, we'll vaccinate all five people. Uh, we will be using the different uh, vaccinations. Uh, we will be using Moderna and Pfizer and also Johnson & Johnson. We have a limited supply of Johnson & Johnson. So we'll not be able to do everyone Johnson & Johnson. Our goal was to finish the homebound population. Thousands have been done in Erie County already uh, in their home by Erie County Department of Health and our partners. And now we expect to do hopefully many more with the VAX visits. So call 858-2929 to get yourself on the list so that we'll come straight out and vaccinate you in your home. With that, I wanna thank everybody for uh, this and we'll certainly open up the questions and answers. But before we begin, uh, because of the better numbers and what we've been seeing with regards to new cases and hospitalizations lately, uh, unless something changes, we will not plan on holding the press conference next Tuesday. We will do it as needed. Uh, so there may be a press conference next week, but it probably won't be on Tuesday. Uh, it could be on Wednesday, Thursday, or if we don't need it for that week, we'd push it off to the following week. Uh, we have a lot of information that we provided these, but some of the information is similar to what we provided in previous weeks. We think now that uh, we've reached a very good level with regards to vaccination. It's not where we need to be. We're getting there, but we've reached a very good level. It's helping to reduce the overall uh, new cases in our community. So for the time being, uh, this will be the last uh, two at Tuesday press conference, uh, though we will, of course, hold additional press conferences in the future uh, with local media as the case warrants. So with that, I will open up the phone lines and uh, we will start with, uh, what haven't I started with in a while? Why don't we start with Spectrum News? Ron, are you there? Hi, Gary? Yes, go ahead. Okay, great. Well, happy Tuesday, Mark. I actually had a, a question for Dr. Burstein. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So the question is, uh, how realistic is it to have a 70% immunity for Erie County by the time that the Erie County Fair rolls around? Um, so uh, do you mean how likely is it that 70% of our Erie County population will be fully vaccinated? Is that, is that your, your question? <clears throat> um, well, you know, our goal is to get as many people vaccinated as possible. Um, you know, we don't expect that uh, either Pfizer or Moderna will have FDA authorization to reach kids below the age of 12 until the end of, uh, end of this year. So we're not gonna be able to reach uh, that population. Um, you know, we're hoping to get to 70%. Uh, we're, um, we're getting closer, we're almost at 50%. So I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic, um, but everybody counts. So everybody who's on the fence, especially they wanna go to the fair, make it easy. You don't have to worry about testing. Um, just please come and get vaccinated. So we're, um, you know, we're, we're hopeful. We're, we're hopeful we're gonna get there, working with some great partners with our schools, our um, many community groups. Um, so we're, we're hopeful we'll get there. Thanks. Thank you. Mike Desmond, WBFO. Yes, again, also for Dr. Burstein, we've had every variation. We've had private schools five days. We've had pre-K five days, high schools. Do you have any sense of where the problem is that kids are becoming infected? Is it two days, five days? Is it young, old? Any sense epidemiologically? Sure. Hi, Mike. Well, there are um, just like adults who have there are multiple potential sources of infection. There are multiple potential sources of infection for school age children. It could be household. It could be uh, we've seen some um, in classroom transmission or in school transmission evidence. Um, now we're starting to see some evidence of uh, transmission in the buses. Uh, we've seen, you know, evidence of transmission in extracurricular activities like sports, uh, dance. Um, you know, just um, kids, you know, going to, to large gatherings with family, with friends. So there are, you know, multiple opportunities for you know, people to get exposed and infected. That's why it's so important that uh, hopefully after Wednesday, when we'll, hopefully we'll be able to vaccinate kids as young as 12, that as many kids get vaccinated as possible. Because if you're fully vaccinated and you're in school and there's somebody in your class who is infected with COVID-19, 
you don't have to quarantine. If there's somebody who is on your sports team that is infected with COVID-19, you don't have to quarantine. You can keep on playing. And then we know that many of the uh, the, um, the schools are, uh, are requiring full vaccination uh, before they can attend the prom or graduation. So the clock is ticking. We're trying to make it easier for everybody to enjoy all extracurricular activities in a healthy way and a safe way, and that's by being vaccinated. So um, again, you know, wherever people People go, they can get exposed. So we're we're just trying to make it safer who who were for everybody to get vaccinated. Thanks. Uh, Mike Baggerman, WBEN. Hi, Mark. This question uh, is obviously for you here. Uh, this is regarding the Buffalo Bills uh, this week season, or rather, just uh, single game tickets are going on sale. I know you want fans to get in there at 100% with the vaccine requirement. I'm curious, though, if you're reconsidering the vaccine requirement, if enough people get vaccinated. If also, are you surprised that other stadiums in the league uh, are not doing the same policy that you announced about a month ago? And just kind of a related question to all this, since the vaccine is only approved for emergency use, do you have the authority to mandate it for fans going to games? Yes, I have the authority based on the powers delegated to me by New York State as well as uh, Erie County. I do have that power. Uh, the second portion of it, or the first portion of your question is uh, with regards to the fall, we certainly want to see our community in, in great shape with high vaccination numbers, but we also know 70,000 people together. Uh, it could be a super spreader event, and we are trying to avoid that at all costs. And that's why New York State has only authorized uh, stadiums to reopen up to, I think, 35% if they uh, are not fully vaccinated. Uh, if they're fully vaccinated, they could have sections at 100%. And I believe the Blue Jays are revisiting uh, the plan that they announced uh, approximately a week or so ago. And I think they're well, actually, they are going to increase the ticket number. They'll be announcing that themselves, but they want, they want to increase the number of people who can go to the games, but those are gonna be in vaccinated sections only. So if the state has not changed the capacity requirements, uh, there's, there's a little things that can be done if people are not going to be vaccinated. But as the governor noted, and I noted last week, and we noted beforehand, if everyone's vaccinated, we could have 100% in the stadium. It's as simple as that. Uh, I know there's a lot of people, or I shouldn't say, there really isn't a lot of people. There's a very vocal minority who are like, oh, you can't force me to, to get vaccinated to go to a football game. Well, there's no reason, there's nothing that says you have a constitutional right to go to a football game. There's nothing that says you have a constitutional right to put other people at risk with an illness that can kill them. I've talked to season ticket holders who have been very happy about what we announced because they were like, I wasn't certain I could go to a game because I didn't want to be sitting next to a 23-year-old who was inebriated and potentially carrying COVID-19. But now if I think that the individuals have to be vaccinated to get in, at least I feel comfortable about the person not giving me COVID-19. Them being inebriated still might be a problem, but at least they're not going to be drunk and giving someone COVID-19 who's sitting next to them. So. Uh, I've had a lot of good response. I mean, you hear the, the vocal minority. There's always a vocal minority out there, but I want to remind everybody, they're a minority. They're a very small portion of the population. And uh, having talked to the Bills, I know that they're expecting a huge amount of people returning for season tickets, and the people are all willing to get vaccinated if that's what it takes. And that's a good thing, because that means we have a caring population that cares about our neighbors, uh, including the individual that may be sitting next to them at a football game. Uh, Sandra Tan, Buffalo News. Hi, thanks, Mark. Um, regarding the VAX visit, are you still reserving all of your Johnson & Johnson supply only for those who are homebound? Um, and uh, are you anticipating that you'll get more and might be able to use that with the VAX visit also? Um, and I'm also curious to know how many folks um, you guys managed to vaccinate at Resurgence Brewing on Saturday. Uh, we to give you a good idea of what happened on Saturday. There were 154 people that were vaccinated by the Erie County Department of Health on Saturday. Eight were done at our clinic in Tonawanda. 146 were done at the Resurgence Brewing Clinic. So certainly a big difference between what was done at the, uh, the mobile clinic that we set up in Tonawanda. Uh, the the, the J&J, once we have sufficient supplies, we'd be willing to open that up to others, but it's more of an issue of ensuring we get some sufficient supplies. Right now, we have a lot of Moderna. We have a decent amount of Pfizer, but we're trying to hold that primarily for the 
now what will be 12 to 17 age category because they are only can get that uh, drug. Uh, Johnson & Johnson isn't exactly where we, uh, it's definitely not where we'd want to be. Uh, we're still waiting for more supply of that. And if we get more supply of it, uh, we will be doing that, not only in the homebound clinics, the VAX visits, but also at these uh, one and done clinics that we hopefully will be handling very soon, like at breweries, like at restaurants, like in parks that we're planning to do once it gets a little warmer uh, in the summer. We really want to get those individuals who may not come to us to our clinic, but if we can get them where they are and we get them once and they're done, that's great. Uh, we just don't have the same quantity of uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson like we do the Moderna and Pfizer. I think we actually have more than 10 times Moderna and Pfizer combined than Johnson & Johnson. Dr. Burstein is giving me the head bob like this. Uh, see, I do pay attention to meetings. But uh, we, we just, we're not there yet where we can uh, offer Johnson & Johnson to everyone at any of our clinics. Uh, Channel 2, Jeff Preval. Yeah, thanks, County Executive. Wanted to ask you about the county's uh, transmission rate. Um, you had mentioned about it dramatically dropping, and of course, the 100 new cases per 100,000, that's what the CDC and the state look at in terms of uh, possibly bringing back high school and middle school students to um, more in-person learning. And I wonder whether you've heard from schools out there already in the planning stages for that. Well, I do know that schools are watching that number very carefully as we are. We were hoping we'd be under 100 by the beginning of this week. Kind of, We were seeing a, a, a drop on every day and then it kind of slightly leveled out around the 120, but now it's gone down to even closer to 110. Uh, I'm hopeful by the end of this week we'll be less than 100 as a county. If that's the case, then all these issues could be revisited because we will no longer be at that level that the CDC considers as a high risk of transmission, which has a huge impact on schools certainly has a huge impact on school sports. We know the wrestling community is very interested. Uh, if we fell below 100, we certainly would revisit that and uh, quite remove potentially our, our not recommended designation at that point. Uh, so they theoretically could finish the year, uh, but we got to get to that 100 number. Once we get there, that triggers a lot of different things. But until we get there, uh, we're not there just yet. So hopefully, uh, we get there by the end of the week and if we get there by the end of the week and we continue down that trend maybe we'll be having a press conference on friday talking about where we are and, and the impact that that has uh, we're all hopeful that we get to that below 100 and i know the school districts are as well we've had conversations with various school districts in the past week or so uh, in regards to that uh, and as a result if we can get to below 100 uh, it will change a lot of uh, of the rules as to what schools can do uh, and then it's in their hands as to whether or not they're going to do it. And we're not going to we're not going to tell them they have to do it. It's up to them, uh, and they have to be able to do it in a safe manner. But once again, if we saw transmission in a class, we would uh, require quarantine of those who are at the highest at risk. If we see transmission on a bus, we'll require quarantine of those who are at the highest risk, uh, regardless of whether or not it's at or below 100 or above it, because we want to keep that number down. And the best way to do it is to prevent the further spread of it. Uh, channel 4, is anyone on? If no one's on from Channel 4, is anyone on from Channel 7? Uh, yes, I am, County Executive. Jeff Slauson here. Um, with the announcement that the Erie County Fair had the study done that showed they could possibly have 100% capacity, which could time out to about 100,000 people, and your reaction to that, and if that's at all feasible to do by August? Uh, we have not seen the study, though some of members of our staff met with fair representatives yesterday to talk about it. We certainly would like to see the study. Uh, I know nothing about this company. I've never heard of it before. We want to do some background on the company to see if they actually know what they're talking about. Uh, 100,000 people at the fair on every day is a very, very, uh, is a, if we've all been to the fair, we know how many people that is. That's a huge amount. And we want to avoid the super spreader events. We've seen it in the past when we brought people together, whether it's holidays or not, you end up getting transmission. So our goal is to ensure that uh, we have a, a safe fare if it's to go forward. But remember, New York State has to issue the guidance beforehand. New York State might issue the guidance and the fare might say it's not worth it. It might say you can only have 30% there. I don't know. We're waiting for the guidance from New York State. Uh, remember, some of the other county fairs in New York State have already canceled for this year because they didn't get the guidance in time to host it. Uh, the fair uh, presented uh, the, uh, the, the, the idea of, of the proposal. They did not provide us the report. 
is what I've been told. We want to see the report. We want to see the back story about how it was prepared and if it actually does make sense. The other thing we have to remember is when we talk about the Erie County Fair, we're not just talking about Erie County residents. There are people who come from across the country, vendors who come from across the country, the individuals who work the uh, midway, uh, individuals who are hawking their goods that come from across the country. So it's not just Erie County residents, it's people from across the country. And when the attendees, it's not just Erie County residents, it's people from Chautauqua, Cattaraugus, Wyoming, Pennsylvania, uh, Niagara County that come to the Erie County Fair. It is one of the largest county fairs in the United States. And as a result, you wanna make certain it's safe so that you don't have someone who's coming in from an area bringing in COVID in a different strain that may not even be here, uh, and then theoretically uh, getting other people sick. So we look forward to seeing the full report, and I think we look forward to also seeing what New York State issues as guidance. And then of course, we'll have further conversations uh, with the, the Fair Association because no matter what the guidance is from New York State, we have to enforce it. New York State might set the guidance on these fairs uh, statewide, but we're the ones who have to enforce it in Erie County. And as a result, we wanna make certain that we can work with our partners so that it's enforceable, but it's a safe environment for all. The last thing we wanna do is have someone come to the Erie County Fair, get sick with COVID-19 and die from it. Simple as that. Uh, we'll do one more round of questions. If there are any more, uh, Spectrum News, any more questions, Ron? If not, uh, Mike Desmond, any more questions? Yeah, there's been this screaming and shouting for weeks about order, opening the border, and I know you've been very big on economic integration with Ontario, but if you look at the numbers of people who are getting sick in the province of Ontario, do you really want that border open? Well, it's, it's an interesting question, Michael, because last year uh, there was a, we wanted the borders opened, uh, but the Canadians didn't necessarily want Americans going to Canada. <laughs> now the Canadians are worried, and we don't necessarily wonder whether it makes sense to get Canadians here, though we are actually vaccinating Canadians if they come here. I do think that needs to be known, is that the Erie County Department of Health has vaccinated Canadians who can come across the border due to work permits or the like. You just can't travel across the border, but if a Canadian works in the United States, we will vaccinate them. We want to get Canada and Southern Ontario vaccinated if, we, and if it requires our help. The problem is, is the vaccination numbers are very low in Canada and Southern Ontario. And there are strains that we've seen in Canada that have caused some serious infections across, the, uh, across their nation, across the provinces that we really haven't seen here. Maybe we haven't seen it because we are a much higher vaccinated population. Uh, I wanna see the border open, so our, our people who live in, uh, are in the United States citizens that go into Canada to enjoy their properties uh, can enjoy them. I'm not so certain I would suggest going on a trip to Toronto. <laughs> I wouldn't suggest that, but I do think there is something to be said about if an American owns a, a, a cottage at Shirkston Shores or Crystal Beach, if they're vaccinated, I think there would be, it would be okay for them to go up to their cottage if they're vaccinated. If they're unvaccinated, I don't know if I'd wanna set foot in Canada right now because of the, the dangers associated with COVID-19 up there. But I, there is something to be said about allowing this cross-border traffic. Most economic traffic has continued from since day one. If you look at the Peace Bridge, you'll see truck traffic going across it. Uh, you'll see individuals crossing it who may work in the States but live in Canada and vice versa because there has been some cases of that of people uh, who, who work in Canada but live in the States. So we wanna see it restored to normal, but to, be, to do that, they have to have high vaccination rates and right now they don't. And uh, if I was an American citizen, an Erie County resident who owned a property in Canada, yeah, I'd wanna get up there too, but I probably would think twice about going up there if I was not vaccinated because the rates are pretty high still. And uh, until they get higher vaccinations, uh, I'm not certain when they're gonna open up the border. It, it's sad, but that's the issue in, in, in the days that we're dealing with right now. Uh, Mike Baggerman, WBEN. Yes, uh, follow up on the schools question. I could just envision a scenario where uh, the caseload in Erie County gets under 100 uh, new cases per 100,000 over a week, and then maybe a couple days later, say there's a small outbreak somewhere, and then the number gets above 100. Do you know what the, the steps would be for I guess, enforcement if the numbers are hovering right around that 100 mark? Well, a small outbreak will not make a huge difference 
in, in the total number of cases that we see and, the, and that percentage. An outbreak of 100 to 150 could. A small outbreak of less than 10 probably wouldn't have much of an impact when you're still talking about uh, a couple hundred cases or below that per day that are new. So for us, what we want to see is uh, equal numbers across the county. Uh, there will be some areas that potentially would still be over 100 and others that are 100. Uh, and that's not in itself we're, makes sense to shut down the whole county or change, not shut down the whole county, but change the process again. Uh, but if we continue to see after if we went below 100 and then we saw the number ticking back up and it went 110, 120, 130, then we really have no choice. We'd have to put ourselves kind of in the same position we were. For most people, they wouldn't notice a difference. It's really the schools that are, are mostly affected by it. For most, they really wouldn't notice a difference at all. Uh, Sandra Tan? So when, just a quick follow-up, I'm sorry. It, it wouldn't then automatically trigger a school's closing again if it gets above 100. It's the case of, yes, it may be 100, 105, but you know, you're know you reevaluating it. Well, school, the well, schools aren't closed. There's, to my knowledge, there's no schools that are closed. There is, there is school uh, in student for, for every district, even the city of Buffalo, which has a limited amount of students, but there are still some students that are going in person, and most of the suburban districts have been going in person for some time, even if it's on a smaller uh, scale and it's not five days a week. Uh, we, we always have to revisit and look at it. I mean, if there's an issue in uh, the Springville Griffith Institute School District uh, and it's capped in the Springville Griffith Institute School District, it makes no sense to have some pronouncement that affects the entire county and then affects the uh, Ken, Kenmore Kenton School District or the Williamsville Central School Districts when they're not even really close to each other. So everything would be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis at that point. And unless we had a dramatic rise overall in all new cases, then we'd have to consider it with regards to our, our greater community. But the thing to remember is we're not there yet. We're not at the 100 or less over a seven-day period uh, for 100,000 population. So as soon as we get there, that'll be a good thing. We're not there yet. Sandra, any more questions? Yes. Um, in regard to... In light of the fact that the CDC is expected to approve Pfizer for use in uh, 12 to 15 year olds, is there anything, uh, can you provide any more information on what you might be doing to reach out uh, to folks in that age group beyond the clinics you have already announced? Um, and I'm also curious to know where things stand as far as um, the county supply. Uh, this might be a good question for the, the health commissioner, but what is your current supply of the Johnson & Johnson, Moderna, and Pfizer vaccines and have you requested any more state for this week? I don't think we can give you off the top of your head, but we'll be able to get those to you after the call. Uh, the exact number, I know we have over 10,000 doses. <laughs> we have doses. Uh, the Johnson & Johnson is much less. Uh, the FDA approved for emergency use authorization 12 to 15 year olds yesterday. So we are now working to move forward with plans to do more specialized clinics for the 12 to 15 year olds. We have a clinic scheduled tomorrow at Lackawanna High School. That was for 16 to 17 year olds. We were gonna give them Pfizer. Uh, we are also uh, in a position right now where we'd be given Moderna to the parents or the other family members who are 18 and above so that they could all attend graduation together. Uh, are we gonna do 12 to 15 tomorrow in Lackawanna if they? We're waiting for a recommendation tomorrow. Uh, I don't, so uh, right now only 16 and 17 year olds will get uh, vaccinated in Lackawanna. Uh, but if we get some uh, recommendation in the next uh, 24 hours, we theoretically could do 12 to uh, 15 year olds too. Uh, but we 18 and above will also be done. Uh, so as soon as we get that more information and we have more Pfizer vaccine, then we can schedule more of these 12 to 15 year old clinics. Uh, WGRZ, Jeff Preval. Any more questions, Jeff? Yeah, but, yeah, if I could just circle back on the Erie County Fair, do you think that attendees should be vaccinated in order to attend? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's put it this way, Jeff. There's going to be people at that fair who do not live in New York, who travel all across the country. I would not set foot in the fair unless I was vaccinated. I'm fully vaccinated. <laughs> so at least I'll feel better setting foot in the fair, protected knowing I'm fully vaccinated. But I guarantee you there's gonna be a lot of vendors and the like who will not be vaccinated who are coming from other parts of the country. And if I was to go to the fair, I wanna make certain that everyone's vaccinated. Uh, if you got young kids, 
probably won't be able to vaccinate them by that time anyway. But uh, for myself as an adult, someone who's over the age of 50, I wouldn't want to set foot in that fair unless I was vaccinated because you don't know who you're coming in contact with. You could be buying uh, one of their well-known delicacies that's deep fried, whatever it may be, deep fried ho-hos, deep fried pickles, they're all deep fried. Deep fried roast beef on wax sandwiches, it's all deep fried. But sometimes you're getting it from a vendor who may not be a New York State resident, who may not be a resident from the Northeast. They could be a resident of Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, where some of their vaccination rates are exceptionally low. Got to think twice about these large mask events, if it's going to happen. For myself, I feel comfortable now that I've been vaccinated that I'm protected. And I know that similar individuals feel the same way. But if you have a mass event, even in the middle of summer, there's still going to be some individuals who will be carrying it because even last summer when the numbers were low, we were still seeing new cases on a daily basis. And we did have deaths last summer. So I would just remind everybody, we're doing much better, but that doesn't mean we should let our guard down. Uh, if, just, if I could just follow up on that, it, will Erie County make that a requirement? Uh, going on to the next question. At this point, that's I'm uh, moving on to the next question. I don't really have an answer to that at this point. Uh, Jeff Slauson, do you have any more questions? No, I'm all set. Thanks. Okay. Is anybody on from Channel 4? Last call? I guess not. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I do appreciate that uh, we have uh, had this time for the last few weeks on Tuesdays at 2 o'clock. As I said, this will be the last Tuesday at 2 for hopefully you don't see me a Tuesday and 2 again. That means things are going great. We will have additional press conference as needed. We'll provide additional information as always on our social media sites. You can get accurate information from the Erie County Department of Health uh, on the website, its social media site. If you have any questions about vaccines, any concerns, you wonder about them, you wonder about the safety of them, they are exceptionally safe. But if you got your questions, call our hotline, 716-858-2929 until five o'clock each day. We'll be here to answer your questions and if you want to get vaccinated, we'll schedule your vaccine appointment close to you. Take care, everyone. Be safe and well. Thank you, Kendra, for continuing to provide such great uh, service to our community with the American Sign Language. And thank you, Dr. Burstein, as well. Everyone, have a great day.